Hello. Bonari Paidu? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think we should start because I just had a conversation with our vice chancellor, sir. Uh, he is just stuck in the congestion. He, and there's a lot of traffic. He will be joining us very shortly, but I guess we should maintain the time and uh, not keep, uh, you know, like take a lot of, I don't know, you know, like, let's go ahead with this. So I guess uh, it's okay to start, Vaidu? Yes, yeah, we can okay. go ahead. Just give me a time. I'll just start my video. Okay. A very good evening. Uh, greetings from Krishna Kanta Handik State Open University. I thank you all for joining us today on behalf of uh, the Department of History and Surja Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences. I would like to welcome you all to this special lecture as we celebrate Azadika Amrit Mahotsa commemorating the sacrifices made by uh, our freedom fighters who have been left unsung in the pages of history. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, a small uh, brief uh, note by our Vice Chancellor, sir, but since he is caught up in the congestion, uh, I would like to proceed further. And uh, this uh, lecture has been organized as a series uh, celebrating Azadika Amrit Mahotsa. The first lecture was uh, given by Dr. Chandan Kumar Sharma from Dibrugarh University and on the topic, Kukhal Kumar and Fit India Movement in Assam. Uh, before I go on, uh, uh, like, let me introduce you all to our speaker for today. Uh, we have with us Dr. Bernadi Sharma, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of History, Cotton University, and currently the head of the department. Uh, okay, Vice Chancellor Sir has joined us. So uh, yes, yes, took my app, sorry. Okay, that is uh, so very uh, good news for us, Sir. Uh, then I would, uh, uh, I would okay. like to uh, then okay. request you to just give a brief welcome remarks. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. go ahead. Yes. Okay. Okay then. Okay. Uh, so I was. Uh, okay. I'm. Yes, please. Shall I go ahead, sir? Hello. Okay. Hello, Sukma. I'm. Yeah. Sir? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Will you Will you be giving the welcome uh, welcome speech, sir? Yeah. Okay. I I can do. I can. Okay, do. sir. Okay, sir. Then over to you, sir. Over to you. Okay. 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 Thank you, and Dr. Sukhmaya Lama, for distinguished speaker and the uh, participants in this uh, today's evening talk. And today is a very important day in the sense that in our country, the quitting took place during this, uh, and on this particular day, we have fighters. They tried to hoist the national flag at that time. And then in some places like say Hekiazuli and uh, Gohpur, they are ran, became a martyr on this occasion. And I'm indeed very happy that our Huijja Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences have, uh, has organized this particular talk. And this is also in partial fulfillment of the Azadika Amrit Mahotsav and Dr. Sukhmaya Rama and the other faculty members of our Kujja Kumar Bhinga School of Social Studies have been organizing a number of programs. And today also we have invited a distinguished speaker to Bernalis. And the talk would be basically on the fragmented history of Assam and more especially in the context of the Quit India movement, etc. So we are eagerly waiting to listen to the distinguished speaker. And I wish that everyone in our midst today would be able to benefit from this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let me proceed again by introducing our distinguished speaker for today's lecture. We have with us Dr. Bornali Sharma, who is currently the head of the department in in Cotton University, Department of History. Uh, she's a registered PhD supervisor of the university and her research interest 
lies in the history of religious conversions, socioeconomic and political history of colonial India and tribal studies. Uh, she has worked on various research projects and has also presented and published papers in national and international forums. Uh, Dr. Sharma has also acted as a research uh, resource person in different universities in various capacities. Currently, she is working on a book entitled Transitions in the Tribal Economy in Colonial Brahmaputra Valley and its Ramifications. We look forward to the publication of this book and to read it. Uh, for that, uh, congratulations well in advance, Vaidu. And now I would like to request you to take over from here. A very good evening to all present. Honorable Vice Chancellor of Krishnakando Hondikoy Open State, State Open University, Open State University rather, uh, Professor N. N. Sharma sir, uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, dear students and all present here. Uh, it's indeed an honor for me that uh, this so very prestigious institute has extended this invitation to me and has given me the opportunity to speak on an area that is very close to my heart, uh, but uh, I would rather like to you know, confess here that uh, though that's, a, that's an area very close to my heart, I have not uh, worked quite extensively on this area. And nevertheless, I would try to uh, throw some light on the topic that has been assigned to me. Uh, and I have entitled my uh, lecture, uh, fragmented histories of Assam's engagement with the anti-colonial struggle, retrieving a veiled character, Konak Lota Borwa. Um, so let me uh, share the slides, um, share the screen here. Is the slide visible? Yes, by the way, it's visible. Okay. Um, yeah, I also see some of my seniors uh, uh, a part, uh, as part of the meeting, Rajiv Hendikda. So I'm a little nervous, you know, because just because he's there. Anyway, let me, you know, this is with all my limitations, I would try to uh, throw some light on this uh, particular topic. But before I begin, uh, let me... Uh, uh, make it uh, clear that I have actually divided my whole lecture into two parts. And in the first part, I would be uh, dealing with the national uh, struggle uh, in the pan-Indian context. And then I, in the second part, I have, I'll be dealing with uh, the uh, national movement uh, in the context of Assam. And I will uh, narrow it down to uh, Kanaklota Borwa. Sukhmaya, um, uh, uh, can I share the entire screen? How do I share the entire screen? Because you know, uh, because because I'm getting a screen which is actually covering a part of my slides. You know, this uh, particular videos. How can I do that? Um, uh Okay. Uh, are you finding it difficult to uh, present it this way? Uh, uh, yes, because it's covering a part of my slide. Uh, okay, just, just a minute. Let me talk to the IT person. Yes. I'm sorry about that, but uh, no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. Like uh, our uh, today in charge is for the technical part. It's Dr. Sanjeev Bora. So he's looking into the issue. Okay, Dr. Bora, is it possible? Uh, sorry, ma'am, please uh, tell me again um, what is this, ma'am? Like, you know, this uh, another screen is visible here, which is covering a part of my slide. So, uh, how should I get rid of that screen? 
Uh, Ma'am, please go to your uh, screen that you uh, want to share uh, with us. Uh, because I'm please. already sharing the screen. Uh, Ma'am, Ma please control the uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. Yeah. Okay, sure. Should I should I stop share and go to slide share once again? Uh, I I'll just do that. I'll go to I'll just stop sharing here for a moment. Um, uh, so, um, screen share, uh, share once again, but it's still there. Um, okay, let me see like, if I can uh, still carry on with the screen that I'm getting. Uh, yeah, let me, let me see if I find any problem, I'll let you know. Okay. okay sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to, uh, begin with, you know, if we, I look at the uh, dominant historical uh, trends in women's history, what we notice is that, you know, women's history never occupied a center stage. And even when it was written, we find that that was only a part of the larger narratives, a segment of the larger uh, narratives. Um, and even in that genre of history, we what we notice is that discourses of only women whose families were connected uh, to some form of uh, political affiliations, only histories of those women found some space. So for the historians, retrieving the history of the women became a very, very challenging task. And there was a dearth of sources to retrieve the history. And historians had to depend on some of the very non-conventional sources like oral history, folklore, folk tales, personal letters, and uh, so on. In the national struggle, and if we look at its history, we find that participation of men always outnumbered women. That's, that had always been the trend. But What's so crucial here was that women's participation called into question the British right to rule. In other words, when the women became a part of the national struggle, this whole national struggle was legitimized. It's just because when the British came to India, they built a notion of India's backwardness. They created a history which projected the Indians as backward, and that backwardness was woven around the women of India. And when the women came out and they became part of the national struggle, that notion of the British that became contested notion, that notion actually almost uh, was negated by the women's participation in the national struggle. And the women's question in modern India, we find that it underwent series of wide ranging considerations and debates. And in India, uh, the central issues in debates in social reforms, it always centered around women. That is what amount of you know, uh, liberation, uh, liberated space should be given to women or if at all that would be, that should be given to the women or not. You know? So we find that women's question in modern India, there was a you know, huge variations so far as the question of women's uh, share in social reforms was concerned. And this probably was, as Pato Chatterjee had observed, that nationalism had in fact resolved the women's question in complete accordance with its preferred goals. Uh, whether you know, women would be uh, given any space in the national movement, whether the women would be uh, given any share of social reforms, that was decided always by the Congress, by the dominant uh, uh, you know, uh, political organizations of the time. And this was very categorically stated by Parto Chatterjee when he had said that nationalism had in fact resolved the women's question in complete accordance with its preferred goals. And in, in the national struggle, you know, what we notice, and when the women became a part of it, that women had to wage a dual kind of a struggle. The first struggle was against 
It was always against patriarchy. And then only it was a struggle against colonialism. Uh, so when women became a part of the national struggle, we, we, what we notice is that, that that was a manifestation of growth of, it was not only a manifestation of the growth of nationalism, but we find that it also marked a, a resurgence, you know, social cultural resurgence among the women of India. Further, if we make a deeper study of the national struggle, we notice that con Congress's resolution in its struggle against uh, domination of colonialism, it always was built around separation of the cultural space into two spheres, material and the spiritual spheres. And Congress created a dichotomy of material versus spiritual and equated that with the public and the private space. Very conventionally and very typically, it was the men who always dom uh, dom dominated the public space and it was that space, the public space, that became uh, the site of contest, that became the site of negotiation in modern, in modern India. While the home or the inner domain of the sovereignty, that which was also beyond any uh, colonialism or colonization, this was a space which was occupied by the women and the women were perceived as a protector, the nurturer of these inner domain, which was also the con which also the Congress had said was a spiritual essence of the Indian identity. So the public space was dominated by the men, while the private space was dominated by the women. So public space was where uh, material negotiations happened, and the private space was where the spiritual negotiations had happened. Very uh, intriguingly, till 1917, Congress never addressed any of the women's issues directly. In fact, the Congress even refused to make women's question a central issue of any political negotiation with a colonial state. So women's question was first taken up by the extremists. And that was when the extremists appropriated by the then privileged concept of motherhood as a empowering symbol of cultural distinctiveness. And why that was so? Because patriarchy, if we consider it, whether in, uh, in modern or in you know, traditional sense, we find that they constantly try to glorify motherhood as the most prized vocation for women, as if the women had no other identity. She was perceived uh, as a tool which would give birth to healthy babies. She was, she was perceived as, a, as an identity which would give the men a more a, a kind of space of solace at home. So she had her, there was no other identity for her. And even when Bankim Chandra, he composed you know, this uh, hymn, Vande Mataram, we, we find that it was not a call to women to be a part of the political movement, but that was a kind of linking of the idealized womanhood with nationalism. Uh, and of course, in 1905, in the anti-partition movement, uh, women became uh, active in that, in the partition movement, anti-partition movement, and the Swadeshi movement, but that too, her space was still confined to the homes. The scenario had changed with the with entry of Gandhi into active Indian politics. And the most significant change was that, that the movement became a broad-based movement. And Gandhi knew you know, how to mobilize the masses, how to make the movement a broad-based one. And he had very calculatively used certain idioms, he chose certain idioms which could appeal the masses, which could draw the masses to the vortex of the movements. Uh, we find that, you know, Gandhi had upheld Sita, Draupadi and Damayanti as 
uh, as the ideal women, it was not or it was not a property and the mighty were idealized of struggle. Uh, Uh, in 1909, a magazine for women was uh, began by, you know, some very progressive women of that period. And one was, one editor was the daughter-in-law of Motilal Nehru. And one in one of the uh, uh, volumes of that particular magazine, Street Darpan, and that was published in 1901 from Benares, there, the editor had written, just, you know, I would appeal to all to read these lines very carefully. Let Sita, Damanti, and Savitri always be venerated by us. And may our women of today have the great good fortune of achieving the kind of independence and freedom they enjoyed, even as they brought glory to this ancient motherland. So it, what it suggests, you know, so it became quite apparent that Indian middle-class nationalist women, they did not attack gender discrimination in such a way which would actually make a dent in the male domination and patriarchy. And imagine that was, this particular sentence was written by the editor of a magazine, Sri Darpan. So, so even the middle-class you know, women, they did not allow any kind of dent on the male domination or patriarchy. So most activities, at this moment, therefore, you know, of, of the women, therefore confine themselves to uh, at the most reformist issues or demand for greater selfhood or freedom or respect for women. However, women at this stage still did not disown the ideals which she considered as her ideals, the ideals of self-denial and self-sacrifice for women. The Raulat Satyagraha, of course, that uh, was a different kind of movement altogether. And Gandhi had made appeals to the women to become a part of the movement. And Geraldine Forbes had witnessed, uh, had, you know, had made a very startling kind of an observation when she said that this in Raulat Satyagraha, Gandhi had appealed the uh, women to be a part of the movement just to facilitate total involvement of the men at home. Uh, Swadeshi, of course, was a more inclusive and more, uh, it had a more dynamic strategy, but as I have uh, you know, uh, discussed earlier, that still the women operated from home. And in that particular movement, Gandhi, when he asked the women to boycott the British goods uh, or you know, take up uh, Swadeshi activities, he created an active female support base but once again, that was happening from home. And in his initial years, uh, we, Gandhi was not very keen, you know, of having the women in the public space. But one particular incident that happened in Calcutta that had changed Gandhi's perspective on that. So uh, certain women from certain women from very respectable families of Cal Calcutta, you know, when they were actually you know uh, raising their protest in the uh, in the streets they were arrested so they were arrested they were put in jail and there was a huge turmoil in bengal to bring these women out of jail this happened from the respectable families so gandhi kind of you know viewed this as an appropriate tactic to shame men into joining uh, uh, you know shame the men into joining active politics. So 
so he knew that if women you know they became they became a part of the uh, movement and if such kind of incidents happen it would naturally and very normally would draw men into joining active uh, politics and protest so this was you know this particular incident was viewed by gandhi as a tactic you know why women should be a part of the national movement in subsequent times gandhi had outlined some of the uh, uh, some of the attributes like patience and antipathy uh, you know he had established a very close kind of uh, connection in between some of the attributes like antipathy and patience to women in fact he had written that passivity and self suffering which were supposedly the feminine qualities he had associated these qualities as strength of women passivity and self suffering and uh, if we look at gandhi's form of form of struggle you know we find it he often adopted these two strategies in his form of national struggle you know passivity you know passive kind of resistance movement and also self suffering so gandhi went into fasting you know uh, as a very strong method of protest against any form of injustice whether it uh, it was uh, an injustice from the colonial government or from uh, from the indians so he had you know embarked on fasting as a very strong method of protest so this gandhi had actually uh, identified or these qualities or these attributes gandhi had uh, you know uh, had uh, had had connected with Uh, women in uh, women in general not only in india but these uh, these attributes he had connected with the women uh, a very interesting facet of gandhi's movement was that he kind of created an ambience where we find that many forms of social barricades uh, had tumbled for example if you look into you know the involvement of women in the national struggle we find that women from all social spaces all economic spaces rich and poor you know elites and common women they came together and sometimes even into very close physical proximity and they became part of the movement and uh, you know even main female uh, kind of you know uh, space you know that also gandhi could manage to blend at some point of time because gandhi for gandhi you know certain functions like say weaving you know or cleaning you know these uh, kind of activities gandhi believed that were not only i mean these activities should not be carried out by women alone but he had made weaving compulsory for all men and women of course you know this also had another connotation because true weaving gandhi or and also weaving and the uh, this charkha you know jator which he used as an idiom through these symbols gandhi could also create a national kind of a community as sucheta kripalini had observed you know who was also the founder of all india mahila congress in 1940 uh, she had stated uh, that it inspired you know gandhi's form of movement it had inspired confidence not only in women but in guardians of women their husbands fathers and brothers and this is why we find that you know in the gandhian form of movement the women they came out without any inhibitions and most importantly the women now did not have to seek the i quote permission of the man at home because the men at home they felt that the women were secured in the company of gandhi or in any kind of movement that gandhi was launching in india uh in assam too we find that you know uh, post uh, or during gandhian time that women displayed their patriotism their grit their courage their heroism you know in in all in all its uh, bloom in all their blooms and uh, and they had been part of this great uh, struggle for uh, independence and uh, we find that even some of the very orthodox social systems you know in assam uh, were uh, crossed or were violated by the women and even these systems could not deter the women from 
uh, being a part of the uh, of the great struggle. Uh, of course, you know, if we talk about the women's uh, women in in Assam, the women have a in Assam women have a long historicity of being part of active politics. For example, if we look into the history, some of the great uh, you know, women who have been part of active politics where like Tao Khamti was there, Chao Ching, Nangbal Ka Gabharu, Mula Gabharu, Fuleshwari Kumori, Ramani Gabharu, you know, all these are from the Ahum royal families. Uh, so we have an, a, a long history of women being part of the national struggle. However, you know, if we talk of modern times and the national struggle, as soon as women's participation, visible participation happened, only since the launch of the non-cooperation movement by Gandhi in 1921. This movement, Gandhi's movement, or Gandhi's, uh, that Gandhi was part of the national struggle, you know, that also had brought in a structural change in the organizational level of politics in Assam. When a provincial level Congress had come up in Assam, so Assam Provincial Congress Committee was formed in uh, 1921. What's very interesting here that, you know, in 1921, we all know that Gandhi had made his first visit to Assam. That Gandhi actually had a, you know, pre-planned trip to Andhra during the same time. And uh, Gandhi was actually invited to Assam by, you know, uh, some of the leaders of the national struggle like Torun Ram Fukun. And when Torun, from Torun Ram Fukun, Gandhi learned that in Assam, Weaving and spinning, they are integral to every Assamese life. And he, when he came to know that, that weaving and uh, spinning, they are a part of daily chore of every household of Assam, Gandhi called off his trip to Andhra and made the historic tour of Assam in 1921. And we all know that Gandhi had by this time identified uh, spinning and weaving as two very strong associate tools uh, for attaining independence. And so far as women's question is concerned, uh, spinning and salt. Of course, salt was not an issue in Assam uh, because it's not, uh, Assam does not lie on the shore of a sea. But spinning and salt, you know, these two symbols had very uh, vital links with women's self sustaining activities. And Gandhi's move had enabled the women, uh, you know, these because just two, these two activities and also this charkha, jator, you know, women were linked with these idioms. And for this, we find that very ordinary women, you know, the housewives, the very ordinary homemakers of Assam, or not Assam, in India, they could curve out a niche for themselves in the public space. If we, if we just look back to, you know, what... Uh, in 1932, you know, when Gandhi uh, made Charkha an idiom, uh, he had, in fact, uh, a, I, I forgot the name of, you know, that person, a lady from Gujarat. Uh, she was a very ordinary woman, but just because she knew how to spin and weave, at one stroke, she became the leader of the national movement. So Gandhi had very calculatively, you know, chose, he ch chose these idioms as, as, as the national symbols. And this had enabled the women to curve out a niche for themselves in the public space. Uh, of course, you know, like even before Gandhi, uh, uh, it, it wasn't that Asmi's women were not, you know, stimulated to the more liberal ideas because uh, women also in Assam earlier had also questioned the prevalence, prevalence social uh, norms. Sudharma Rupakhyan, uh, which was com which was written in 1884. You know, this had already questioned the problems, social problems, and gender relations. And who would not know about uh, Vishnu Priya Devi? She was a young Brahmin widow, and uh, she solemnized the second marriage with Gunabhiram Borwa. You know, these were all sort of breaking the uh, social taboos that were prevalent in Assam. So it wasn't that liberal ideas were absolutely absent in India. So there are visible. Uh, experiences of this, but you know the the move so far as the national movement was concerned, it had not yet percolated down to the common women. Uh, so you know 
uh, women uh, at this point of time, uh, this consciousness was happening more in families uh, uh, before Gandhi. You know, we find that consciousness was happening more in families where men were educated and where men had political affiliations. Yeah. But that section of the women became a part of the struggle. That section of the women were aware you know, the, of these kind of happenings at a national level. This sort of created an ambience you know, where women from the absolute lower strata of the society, they could be a part of the movement. And this had also, and Gandhi especially, Gandhi's movement had uh, given the women the confidence to slowly push their autonomy, but still without being deviant. Of course, you know, certain uh, uh, exceptions are there. You know, Sondra Prabha Hoikyani was an exception here. But if we talk about women in general, we find that women push their autonomy, but they were still not deviant. Yeah? Uh, so Janki Nair had probably correctly observed that women still consented to the hegemonic aspirations of the nationalist patriarchy. And this probably was a reason why in 1921, when Torunram Fukan's wife, Vidur Prabha Devi, she along with some of her associates had uh, you know, made all the arrangements to defy the 144 CRPC that was in January 1921. Gandhi had advised her that she should remain away from such aggressive acts and rather she should concentrate only on certain organizational works. And Vidur Prabha Devi, uh, you know, uh, she did not defy uh, whatever was advised to her, her by Gandhi. Uh, if we look at history, you know, we have uh, quite a number of evidences, you know, history is full and copious with uh, evidences of the history of the elite women. But certain characters, even in this particular movement, you know, this non-cooperation movement, which started uh, in Assam from Torunram Fukun's house, where there was a bonfire of, you know, uh, of, of all, you know, foreign goods, foreign clothes there. In this particular movement, a very interesting story, which I, uh, you know, came across very recently, and I have put in the source here. It's from a text. It's from a book. It's an edited book on Nirbar Pita Onol. It's, and I'm very proud to say that this book has been brought out by the publication Cell, the first publication of Cotton University, the first publication of the publication Cell of Cotton University, and the responsibility of this entire book was given to the Department of History, Cotton University. And this is a book on the unknown uh, figures of the national struggle, the unsung heroines of the national struggle. So we have documented the history of the un unsung heroes. And it's from this particular text that I have come across this character that is Forsini Begum. Uh, you know, she. She was, of course, an acquaintance of uh, Toruna Fugan. Uh, she was from Garigao area of Guwahati. And when this, uh, uh, as a part of uh, non-cooperation movement, when there was a bonfire of uh, foreign clothes in Toruna Fugan's house, she brought along with her all the commodities. Of course, she belonged to an agricultural family, but she brought along with her all the foreign commodities that she had at home to be subsumed in the fire that was, you know, uh, going on as part of the non-cooperation movement in Tornam Fugan's house. And this Forsani Begum was also responsible for, uh, you know, arousing the women or making the women in uh, Pandu and Garigao area aware of the uh, Swadeshi movement and later the 1942 Quit India movement. Uh, so, uh, and this, uh, her story has been brought to light. I'm once again proud to state that this is brought to light by one of my students, he's Saurav Sagya. Uh, so I have actually uh, taken the reference from him and I take the opportunity uh, to congratulate uh, Saurav for bringing Forsani Begum to the light. Uh, So if you talk about you know, saga of Assamese women's association with the national struggle, uh, 
And if we do not take into consideration the stories of uh, some of the you know, lesser known figures, our history would always remain fragmentary. And more so if we do not take into consideration some of the women who had been part of the tea labor community, like Mangri Urang, she was also known as Multimum, Multimem, she was more famously known as Multimem, and Durgi Bhumij, uh, you know, uh, Orupa Putongya Kalita, she has written a very beautiful text, you know, a very beautiful novel. Here, Durgi Bhumij is the protagonist, and it's, I have the book here, which was given to me by Okunchita Bortakur, my colleagues, it is Josnar Jitas by Orupa Potangya Kulita. She has given a very vivid description of this particular lady who had been part of the anti-colonial struggle. Uh, and we all are perhaps by now aware that Mangri Orang or Multimem, she is today considered the first woman martyr of Assam. Uh, I actually forgot to, you know, uh, like uh, enlighten you uh, or inform you about my lecture that, you know, I should have told this much earlier that when I took up this particular topic, I thought that I would be highlighting mostly on the characters of Assam whose history has not been part of the dominant historical trends. The history of the elitists, you know, that's already uh, in the uh, dominant historical narratives. We find, a, I mean, they already found a space in the, domi the dominant historical narrative. So I thought that, you know, my, I would, uh, you know, limit my lecture to some of the characters who are not part of the dominant historical trends. So as a part of that, you know, some exemplary characters which I came across, one was Dwarikdas Borua. And she attained martyrdom in 1932. And she was five months pregnant you know, when she became a martyr. Because despite her you know, physical limitation, uh, she had not deterred herself from being a part of the great civil disobedience movement. She was martyred. She was killed by the police in 1932. Certain other characters like Guneshwari Devi from Nogao. So she was, uh, she was not only exemplary because she spread the message of Gandhi in, in some of the very remote areas. You know, there are, these areas are still remote. If you go to these areas, you find that they are still remote. But she not only spread the message of Gandhi in these you know, remote areas, but she could also ignite the minds of these women to come out of their homes, to come out of their homes to the public space and raise their voices of protest. And this is exemplary. And Guneshwari Devi at that time, you know, it was, it's almost, you know, around, uh, around 90 years back. So Guneshwari Devi from Nogao, she became the first, you know, prisoner who was imprisoned by the state machinery. We have, you know, certain uh, characters like from Gulaghat, Madhavi Sunwal and Dharmeshwari Gogoi, uh, who were intercepted on their way to Calcutta when they were, uh, when they had gone there, you know, when they were on their way to uh, jo join a congress session, they were uh, arrested. They were put in the prisons of Calcutta, and they were languishing there for months. Okay? They were, there was, I mean, uh, in a Calcutta prison, women around ninety years back, you know, they were imprisoned there. Bhogeshwari Fukunani, she was an octogenarian lady, such a brave lady, you know, she, uh, and. The way she uh, confronted the, uh, the state machinery, and despite her age, you know, she was part of the movement, she attained her martyrdom, and she was from Borhampur, a very remote area, a remote, still a remote area. We have characters like uh, from Gulaghat again, Siddhaswari Hajorika, Rameshwari Bora, Roheshwari. Uh, they were arrested, they were taken to the number forest. You know, a forest that we are still, you know, uh, you know, do not dare to cross at night. They were taken to the number forest and they were released there in the middle of the night. Uh, uh, such brave, you know, these women were. Uh, of course, you know, we cannot uh, overlook uh, the, 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 the characters, you know, who 
had uh, defying all the odds that women were facing at that point of time. You know, these characters which had played so crucial role, so vital role in the national struggle, not uh, and who had been hugely responsible for mobilizing the women of Assam. Now we are all aware of characters. Chandra Prabha Hoykyani, Hem Morali, Omar Prabha Das, Hemant Kumari Devi, you know, Adivi Sonwal, and scores of other women who had played a very significant role in the national struggle. Chandra Prabha Hoykyani, how can Assam's history of national struggle be complete if we do not talk about the demands, the role that these iron lady Chandra Prabha, Chandra Prabha Hoykyani had played in the freedom struggle? not only in the freedom struggle, but she was a woman, she was a force who had demanded equality and emancipation for all Assamese women. And of course, you know, it was under her leadership and guidance that Ahom Mohila Committee uh, saw the light of the day in 1925. This particular organization, I'm not going to discuss in detail here, but this particular organization was responsible for giving a more, uh, a more I would say, uh, uh, an organized kind of an, you know, a, a, a channel, uh, which uh, where the aspirations of the Asmis women uh, found expression. Uh, this was the role, you know, this Mohila committee, of course, you know, it was also working for the emancipation of the, uh, the supposedly, you know, powerless women of Assam, social upliftment of the of the Assamese women, their education and improvement of social condition. And Sondra Prabha Hoykyani, she was the figure that was behind, the force behind the birth of this particular organization called Home Mohila Committee in 1925. So I have uh, 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 an image of this iron lady here, Sondra Prabha Hoykyani. Pushpalata Das, another, uh, I would say, you know, just after Sondra Prabha Hoykyani, Pushpalata Das, uh, very, you know, uh, she was a very highly educated, you know, lady from Assam. And she had very meticulously organized and planned and consolidated the activities of the Shanti Bahini, Hanti Bahini, or the Peace Corps, and the Mitru Bahini, or the Death Squad. Uh, she was the one who had very meticulously organized these two cells of the national struggle. And these two cells, in effect, you know, could stir countless number of volunteers of Assam uh, to join the national struggle. An image of uh, Ushpalata Das here. Uh, and it was under her leadership that Home Pradesh uh, Congress, the women's cell of the Assam Pradesh Congress, uh, came up, uh, though we often find that this, you know, uh, that this was a kind of a, a tactical move of the Congress uh, to keep the women out of the vital politics of Congress. Uh, so it was these leaders who had inspired, who had spurred, stirred the imagination of countless number of women, and one among them was Kanaklata Borwa. So along with Konoklota Borwa, and along with Pushpalata Das, Sandra Prabha Hoykyani, and Jyoti Prakhat Agarwala, these two figures two had, you know, to a huge extent, stirred the imagination or you know, roused the patriotic uh, you know, fervor in Konoklota Borwa. However, you know, we cannot be oblivious to the fact that by the time Konoklota Borwa uh, you know, came into the forefront of the national struggle, an edifice had already been created in Assam because uh, you know this riot sabhas uh, which uh, went and worked at the grassroots level. These are this was these uh, sabhas were functioning very forcefully in Assam. Women's cell of the Assam Pradesh Congress Committee had already come up. Ahom Mohila Committee have come up, and also Ahom Satra Hamilon. You know these were by this time by by the time Konoklota had come to the forefront, these are already working in Assam. Uh, most importantly for Kanaklata, that by this time, and thanks to the uh, you know, initiatives that were taken up by Gandhi, the women had already uh, created a niche for themselves in the social space 
for which the women from different stratas were accommodated in the national struggle. Talking about Konoklutha Borwa, uh, she was born on 22nd December 1924 in Borongabari, then Dorong district. Father was a Krishna Kanta Borwa and mother Karneshwari Borwa. Uh, what's important was that, you know, she was not an ordinary child, even from her childhood. So she, as a child, she displayed all the qualities of a young man of very, very strong determination. An image of Kanakrata Borwa here. Uh, she hailed from a very ordinary agrarian family in a very remote area. Uh, and the patriarchal values like any ordinary Indian you know, uh, society and you know, families, these patriarchal values were working very forcefully even in Konokrata Borwa's you know, uh, society that she grew up and the society that she was nurtured in. However, Konokrata Borwa, she became often at a very young age, 13, she was 13. And because of that, probably, you know, she developed a very strong spirit of independence and responsibility since that young age. She was 13 then. So spirit of independence, spirit of responsibility was already in her. Talk about the chores at home or uh, the, the, the meetings, you know, these political meetings that were held in and around her area. She would complete all her works, all her household chores, and she would just, you know, escape to be part of these meetings, even from her even since the age of 13, uh, she was actually you know, raised by her grandparents, her grandfather, grandmother, were the ones who had raised her up. Uh, so Konoklota, to talk about Konoklota, we'll have to you know, deal with uh, some of the early experiences of Konoklota to know the Konoklota, the woman that we know today. So she was, as I said, that she was under the care of her gra grandfather, Ghanokanta Borwa, and he was actually an activist at the local level. He was an activist of the freedom struggle. And she, uh, under his guidance, under his care, that Konoklota Borwa was exposed to the various you know, facets of exploitative nature of the colonial rule. And it was from him, she, was, she came to know about the national movement that was happening under the leadership of Gandhi. She also had some leave experiences because at a very young age, you know, when she was once she was traveling with her grandfather uh, and you know, they were crossing off, there was an, a, a horse driven cart was of a tea garden manager, English manager was coming from the other side and seeing Konaklota and her grandfather, you know, these horses got petrified and they just threw the manager and his wife out of the carriage. So at this incident, the manager, he rebuked Konoklota and her grandfather. So Konoklota asked her grandfather, why this is so? We haven't done anything wrong, but why this is so? Then her grandfather explained that this is just because we are not independent. Had we been independent, you know, these uh, foreign, you know, foreigners, this these managers who were the British, they wouldn't have behaved with us the same way. So these kind of you know, experiences had stirred the young Konoklota's mind. Apart from that, Moniram Borwa was there, Jyoti Prakhar Agrawala, he was making the movie Joymoti during this time. And Konoklota Borwa, she was so, you know, she was so enthusiastic, she was so energized that, you know, along with some of her classmates, she was a very young girl then. She just, you know, uh, sneaked into the uh, premises of Jyoti Prasad's, you know, home where Jayamati was being filmed. She was also, you know, stirred by some of the passionate speeches of Vishnu Rabha. Uh, you know, these sort of created, uh, you know, nurtured a rebellious character in Konoklota since her childhood. Uh, and of course, you know, she was also uh, very skilled, as I, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, that she was a very, you know, independent kind of a, uh, independent spirited kind of a girl. And she was very skilled in spinning and weaving. And Gandhi's call for, you know, use of charkha, spinning, you know, these kind of uh, had sufficiently ignited the young mind of this, uh, of Kanaklota. 
and in it she saw a hope for an economic liberation yeah, when because she herself was you know skilled in spinning and weaving come 1942 that atmosphere uh, was already surcharged you know with these radical spirit gandhi had adopted a more radical spirit by this time you know he was more militant you know by this time adopting do or die a kind of an attitude uh, with the british uh, you know or a sort of a last engagement with the british with the spirit of do or die uh, so this spirit had actually percolated down into these uh, you know localities in these locals in tejpur too we find that satyagrahi is where divided into the hanti bahini the peace corps and the mrittu bahini the death squad so uh, in 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 this squads you know all able bodied persons irrespective of the gender they could enroll as members of these you know these bodies these cells and in mrittu bahini uh they were trained to even sacrifice their lives you know instead of surrendering uh, so here is a uh, image of gandhi not in assam of course you know in 1942 a more radical kind of gandhi in 1942 uh so uh, this uh, rai sabhas as i mentioned earlier had also played a very robust role if this rai sabhas had not been there if the provincial congresses had not been there probably these you know nationality nationalistic ideas you know these would not have percolated down to the grassroots level as you know as it happened because of the functioning of these kind of organizations especially riot sabhas and in konoglota's area a riot sabha uh, i'm sorry for the spelling i have uh, i have written it wrong it's a riot sabha it's not riot sabha is riot sabha was held in bomiri fields which was not quite away from the residence of konoglota and this uh, was under the leadership of jyoti prakash agarwala and the uh, uh, the the hotra dikar of gormur hotra pitambar deva goswami he had been uh, invited to preside over the meeting and in this particular meeting sondra prabha hoykyani had also delivered a very fiery speech so this you know cumulatively this had sparked the imagination of uh, you know people of assam and and konoglota borwa in specific this meeting it was you know like uh, a, a, a no it it was it wasn't a very normal kind of a meeting where the people were just urged to be a part of the national movement we find that in this meeting bhagat singh was discussed you know this young boy uh, with all the rebellious kind of spirits you know bhagat singh was discussed and the martyrdom that he attained at such an such a young age you know these kind of you know uh, 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 these kind of happenings pan indian happenings were discussed in this meeting so uh, very naturally you know we find uh you know these spirits percolated down down to at least some of the asus people uh, so they were even not you know these spirits of you know fearlessness spirits very strong spirits of you know patriotism where they even uh, you know sufficiently you know uh, gathered the courage to even defy death they were no longer you know fearful of death uh uh, uh so a very interesting feature here i don't know i'm not aware of whether this happened in rest of india or not but in assam you know a special feature was that whenever you know these uh, the leaders of these movements they were jailed the volunteers they moved from villages to village or you know, village to village hailing the jail leaders for their acts of heroism uh, this was a quite you know an unusual kind of development that were happening you know even in konoglota's village the leaders the the volunteers of you know these riot sabhas they would move from village to village they would just hail you know sing glories of these uh, of these you know prisoners which had been you know sent to prison or which had been imprisoned by the state machinery uh, of course you know these kind of uh, happenings Uh, would definitely you know leave an indelible kind of an impression in the young mind of konoglota and especially 
the accounts of valor and self sacrifice of bhagat singh these kind of you know uh, you know uh, incidents had uh, sufficiently stirred konaklota's young mind so by 17 konaklota already had the vision of a liberated india uh, and she enrolled herself as a member of the death squad she was just 17 pushpalota das tried to dissuade her from joining the death squad because she was not yet 18 but konaklota you know uh, her mood was of a different kind now so she had already learned to defy death master any kind of fear of death by this time uh, in assam this uh, 1942 movement uh, it had adopted both violent and non violent forms violent uh, when all visible symbols of colonial authority uh, you know they were sabotaged and non violent method was in the form of hoisting of the tricolors there was an appeal from the you know higher rank of the congress of gandhi that uh, you know that tricolors should be unfurled in the, in the uh, dominant you know public uh, spaces as an assertion of independence uh, probably you know gandhi had also used this as a technique to bring in the common mass into the vortex of the national movement uh, so you know there was there were preparations for uh, hoisting of tricolor in the a uh, district headquarters or you know some of the uh, prominent uh, public spaces in 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 gohpur you know there were arrangements to a uh, hoist the national tricolor in the gohpur uh, police station so, so under the leadership of uh, we all are aware of mukunda kakoti korneshwar hajorika jiten bora you know they they were the leaders here and this is uh, the jaronial khotra uh sources uh, shila bora mens konaklota borwa uh, so in this particular khotra just two days prior to martyrdom of uh, konaklota borwa a secret meeting was held where the whole plan was discussed so this is the khotra here uh, and you know this public they lined up for the rally and the young girls and the women they occupied the front position of the rally and perhaps this was uh, as observed in this text cambridge campaign into gandhi that congress believed that placing the women at the front of the nationalist processions and picket lines would minimize the police attacks so uh, konaklota was in the front row uh, you know in this rally uh, she was accompanied by mukunda kakoti and they were you know like uh, raising slogans uh of glory to mahatma so it was once again mahatma vande mataram you know these kind of slogans were raised by konaklota and her associates uh, so she was actually you know before she fell to the bullets she was in fact warned by some some people you know that she should not move ahead because police were just ahead of them and anything anything could happen but konaklota said that we are brave assamese women and we are not uh, uh, you know uh, uh, of uh, we are not afraid of that uh, she moved ahead and of course the rest is history uh, the bullets pierced the bodies of the young body of konaklota borwa uh, so this is the uh, police station bahpura police station hoy to jot konaklota she attained her martyrdom this is in its present form of course uh, so what i would like to draw in here that konoklota's engagement with the national struggle it wasn't just a spontaneous reaction it wasn't a spontaneous reaction of a young a passionate girl we find that this her reaction to the national movement it was largely a kind of deliberate kind of you know uh, movements deliberate kind of actions that were undertaken by konaklota borwa so she already had a fair amount of grooming in anti colonial opinions under her grandfather order the provincial congress the riot sabhas you know these could also 
uh, had worked sufficiently to integrate the people and the women uh, as well uh, to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, na- with the national uh, struggle. Uh, and if we, if we observe, you know, uh, the whole phenomena, we find that Gandhi had transformed the lives of purposelessness of the lives of scores of women to one of engagement and commitment. Uh, so we, there are, you know, this is Konoklota is one incident which we took around more than, a, more than half a century to retrieve her, to know her history. But I'm sure, you know, there are scores of Konoklotas spread all over India. And if we do not take a more integrated kind of a movement, uh, I mean, effort, if we do not take a very serious kind of an effort, the history of scores of other Konoklotas would never be unheard. And I'm very happy that, uh, uh, you know, uh, that, and, and, and of course, you know, like uh, Konoklotas character, you know, other characters like Konoklota, they would never find a space in a dominant historical narrative if we do not take more integrated effort to bring, to retrieve such characters out of oblivion and give them their due share in the, uh, in a dominant historical trends. Thank you so much. Uh, so here, uh, set an image. Uh, this commemorating the martyr, this is the Sohit Bedi, an image of Konoklota in Gokpur. And here is a list of bibliography. Thank you so much. So, uh, uh, so you know, like, uh, I, I, I would just like to reiterate that Konoklota's was not a spontaneous kind of uh, an action of or action of a passionate young girl. Very systematically, uh, over the years, she had developed an anti-colonial sentiment. Of course, you know this was, uh, you know, aided. This was uh, this was facilitated by a number of factors which worked together to for Konoklota to inculcate that spirit of you know defiant spirit and the spirit of patriotism that she had. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, the session is now open for uh, any questions uh, that our uh, participants and listeners might put in. Uh, we had asked for the questions to be shared in the chat box, but for now we do not have any questions. Uh, like in the meanwhile, meanwhile, if anybody has to ask something, uh, they may write or they may also ask themselves by, uh, you know, taking, you know, like unmuting their systems. Uh, Ma'am, I just have a, a, you know, like, uh, if I look into the whole issue of women participation in the Indian freedom struggle, uh, what we see is their representation has more or less been very symbolic. Uh, if we look into how, uh, you know, it was uh, the, uh, the way that Gandhi saw their, uh, saw their role, how he, in his initial phase, tried to uh, define their role. But I also see that, and uh, I don't know if you would agree that the way uh, they try to domesticate the public sphere and also, you know, like politicize their own domestic sphere. For example, the home, which is a private sphere became a place where they were discussing about uh, the movement, about uh, rioting and picketing. I guess uh, these were small ways in which they were trying, women were especially trying to negotiate their way and to, you know, to further play a more substantial role in the Indian freedom struggle. What do you say about that? Yeah, you are right. You are right. You know, and, and I believe, you know, Gandhi was, uh, you know, like he was, uh, uh, he hugely responsible for that. Like, even staying at home, you know, women could, uh, uh, you know, become a part of the national struggle. You know, she could think of the national str- struggle. So she did not just remain beneficiary or, you know, uh, just observer of whatever was happening at the national level. But Gandhian, you know, form of struggle could also integrate or she, the woman became a comrade of the national struggle. Even staying at home, you know, she could do that. This is first, you know, in during the first part, and however, in the later part, we find that 
you know gandhi could uh, you know uh, create an aura and could actually uh, kind of give a confidence to the men at home for which the women you know could come out of their homes you know and be a part of the larger uh, nationalist uh, movement yes. you are right yeah thank you baido uh, do we still have anyone who would like to uh, you know have any thoughts on uh, the presentation that baido gave right now um yeah i, I see a comment here from one hemen hajorika Uh, yes. So he, he has said that government should take steps to glorify all other unfamous martyrs like one of the. And thank you for your observation, Heman Heman Hajorika, Mr. Heman Hajorika. But uh, uh, you know, before the government does anything, you know, it's task of uh, you know people like us, you know, historians, who would first have to unearth such characters. We will have to retrieve the characters, uh, you know, uh, uh, from oblivion. We'll have to bring them, you know. Uh, we'll have to bring them to the spotlight first only then you know can government come up with uh, you know glorifying such kind of you know veiled character uh, can do that so i, I think you know like uh, as uh, as educators ourselves ourselves and you know as as you you know institutions your universities we should encourage the young students you know these young learners uh, to work more you know uh, vigorously on on such areas you know because elitist history you know we find their reflection in the dominant trends it, it's not much of an issue but you know like unearthing the history of you know these kind of characters it takes actually a lot more imagination you know lot more integrated effort and we concertedly you know like educational institutions educators government you know together i think you know we can uh, you know do this I, i'm very hopeful of that i'm very hopeful of that Uh, do we have any questions i guess uh, okay uh, so aruna yeah. has asked <clears throat> thank you okay. sukmaya i do not have any questions just an excellent lecture right i was having the evening walk at the same time i listened to the entire lecture thank you very much madam for the wonderful lecture Thank you, sir, so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to, you know, speak on uh, this area. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. You, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have one uh, comment from our uh, participant, and uh, Arunab Das. He has written, "It is disheartening that women's representation in the pre-Gandhian era was not encouraged. However, at the same time, we see Annie Besant leading the Home Rule movement just before Gandhi jumped actively into the freedom movement. Was it because Besant was a foreigner that Indian people saw her differently than Indian women, and hence she was able to be a leader?" Uh, Uh, of course you know like um, as you have correctly observed arunav das that it's really disheartening that uh, women's representation uh, was not enough in the pre gandhian era uh, but uh, uh, what i would say is you know like uh, this was not an exception only in india uh, even if you you know uh, go to uh, you know countries beyond india you'll find that you know women's representation were still not very encouraging in the other countries though the british you know these they were our colonial masters they were talking of you know civilizing mission they were talking of people with superior you know uh, racial superiority but even in their country the position of women were not it was not very encouraging they had to wage long struggles to in fact even get the right to vote franchise uh uh so and any person's question it's it's not uh, that just because she was a foreigner even we you know women like uh, uh, uh like sucheta kripalani for example or women like uh, uh this uh, i just forgot her name like was the first president of uh, was the first uh, uh, chief minister of uh you know this united province uh, was she uh, i just forgot her name you know certain characters were of course there you know like these however were exceptions these were not uh, the norm you know like uh, women had been there you know we have had great characters even in the past you know uh, like uh, you know like uh, uh, sarojini naidu i was talking about you know like yeah these were characters which did play very you know dominant role in the national struggle but these were always exceptions 
And if we talk in Assam, if we talk about, you know, such characters like Sonra Prabha Hoikyani, she was an exception, you know, uh, because we are also aware of her personal life. But despite that, you know, she had all the courage to not only, not only, you know, uh, not only speak of uh, social emancipation of women, but she also talked about equality of women, you know, at that time. So these certain characters, these would always remain an exception. You know, we will have to, however, work harder, you know, uh, to see that, you know, women in the real sense of the term, they occupy the same uh, in a position, social space as men do. Thank you, Vaidu. Uh, any more uh, questions? Okay, I think, you know, I was yeah. clear enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can close the session. Yes, Shukana. okay. Okay, then uh, let me proceed to the next agenda, which is the vote of thanks. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, thank our university authorities for giving the institutional support uh, for organizing this event. I would also like to thank our distinguished speaker for today's lecture, Dr. Bonali Sharma Baidu, for accepting our invitation and uh, giving us her time, uh, valuable time uh, to speak on this occasion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baidu. Uh, I would also like to thank all our participants who have been here, uh, who have joined us uh, for today's session. Uh, this would not have been possible without your support too. I would also like to offer my thanks to my colleagues, uh, my department uh, colleague, Dr. Priti Salila Rajkua, and also not to uh, forget uh, 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 to thank uh, Professor Joydeep Borwa, uh, the director for Sujay Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences, who has been uh, very supportive throughout this uh, program and in also planning up the whole uh, event, uh, celebrating Azadi Ka Amrit Mahasar. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you to all my colleagues. And last but not the least, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sanjeev Bora, uh, assistant professor in, uh, in the department of SMEs. Uh, for give, uh, for helping us with the technical support. And uh, I would like to thank you all once again and declare the program to be over. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Baidu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.